Well, welcome everyone to the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies, which is located on the unceded territory of the Lenape people. And welcome to our COVID capitalism series. Um, again, please use the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen to share um, any questions that come up during this event. Today, we're discussing the rise of racist nationalism, borders, capitalism, and the migration crisis. And our conversation takes place at a time of resurgent far-right ethno-nationalism, white supremacy, and anti-Muslim racism. We see this happening on many levels. There's a rise in far-right militias. We see the far-right rise to political power, most recently with the electoral gains of the religious Zionist party in Israel and the far-right Sweden Democrats in Sweden which of course add to an already expansive roster of racist nationalist political power across the world. And of course, we're responding, also continue to respond to the recent murder of Asian women in Atlanta, murders that are connected to centuries of racist imperialism in the US from Asian exclusion acts and the devastation of the opium wars to the racist framings of the pandemic and the demonization of China today. Speaking of the pandemic, after a year of COVID-19, uh, vaccination in the United States is proceeding in a predictably inequitable and inefficient manner. And while we complain about that, the global public health apartheid is more undeniable than ever as people in much of the rest of the world are prevented access to these vaccines by a system that privileges profit over lives. The pandemic has sharpened anti-migrant racism and violence across the globe as migrants are demonized for supposedly carrying and spreading the virus. Despite much hope placed by US-based liberals on the election of Joe Biden as far as uh, migration systems, this week uh, recent news alone bring us headlines of the Biden administration deporting more Haitians in just a matter of weeks than President Trump did in an entire year uh, using Trump's own public health order. As our guest today has convincingly demonstrated, understanding what happens to Haitian migrants to the United States is key to understanding the whole system of imperialist borders. And I'm thrilled and honored to introduce our guest, Harsha Walia. Harsha is a community organizer an award-winning author, and currently the executive director of the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association. She has been a leader in movements for migrant justice, as well as anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, abolitionist, indigenous solidarity, Palestinian liberation, and feminist movements. I first encountered Harsha's work in following the No One is Illegal movement, which is an anti-colonial, anti-racist, and anti-capitalist migrant justice movement. And then I read Harsha's first book, Undoing Border Imperialism. And I can honestly say that Undoing Border Imperialism really changed the way that I think about borders and migration. And I've had the great pleasure of sharing this book with my students. Uh, Harsha has a very long list of articles and think pieces that I won't list in the interest of time. But she's also co-authored two books, uh, Never Home, Legislating Discrimination in Canadian Immigration, and Red Women Rising, Indigenous Women Survivors in Vancouver's Downtown East Side. Her latest book, Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism, is out now with Haymarket Press and has already garnered a tremendous amount of attention and acclaim. This book is indeed as Robin DJ Kelly put it, a shock to the system. I found it devastating, profound, and inspiring. Harsha, if you don't mind, I would like to dive right into um, border rule, make sure the listeners get a taste of your arguments. And everyone, um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens uh, to submit your questions during the event. Um, Harsha, how do you explain the rise of, of the far right at this historical moment? And why, why do you insist that we approach it as a global phenomenon? Thank you. Let me just say thank you so much for the kind invitation and for the generous introduction. It's, it's an honor to be in conversation. 
Um, and also I want to say that I'm on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the lands of the Musqueam, the Suela Tooth, and the Squamish. And you know, in the in the context of, of talking about capitalism and the rise of the right, that really has to be situated in these historic processes, right? Of how uh, the rise of the right is situated in this devastating history and ongoing history of imperialism and conquest and enslavement in its many contemporary forms. Um, and uh, the reason that I insist on, on thinking about the rise of the right in a global context is primarily because I think um, for those who are located in the United States, there's often a sense of, um, you know, just the United States being the belly of the beast, which it is. And of course it enacts, you know, it's one of the greatest purveyors of violence, but structures um, travel, right? And, and the rise of the right travels. And particularly because even though there are many contradictions between right-wing forces, those forces are connected to each other. Um, increasingly, you know, the training ground for far-right forces is in parts of Europe, um, is in, you know, increasingly in Israel and India. And so in order for there to be a rigorous leftist response, we have to be as internationalist as the right intends to be, right? Um, and also to be attentive to the ways in which when we're talking about capitalism, when we're talking about nationalism, even though a lot of nationalists present themselves as a kind of parochial, uh, localist, populist force, um, they really are transnational, right? And so I think it also allows us to kind of break through the idea um, that right wingers are, you know, the common refrain of them being nativists, right? Because they're not actually nativists in that way that, of course, they're racist indigenous people. Uh, but they're white supremacists in the in the European and North American context and elsewhere, you know, they're Zionists and or they're Hindu fascists. And so I think seeing the similarities allows us to think beyond our local context and allows us to think beyond the exact trap that the right wants us to, to be stuck in, um, which is the local and the kind of parochial. Um, but I think, you know, around the world, there's a few things and, you know, I don't want to say anything definitively because it's, it's a, a lot to think about the rise of the right in the global context, but I'll just say two quick things. You know, one is that I think it's really important to see the rise of the right in our contemporary moment um, in relationship to the rise of centrist neoliberalism um, and how both neoliberal economic policies and liberal kind of political policies and that kind of centricism is part and parcel, it's not the same as fascism, but it goes hand in hand with it, right? It creates the foundation, it creates the social and economic and political conditions in which fascism thrives and responds to. Um, it's the Frankenstein of it. And so I think that is um, one way in which we need to think about fascism is the failure of neoliberalism. And again, the need for a much more radical internationalist real left response to fascism. Um, and I think second and related to that is, you know, the politics of austerity, right? Just the devastating economic, but really deeply psychological impact um, since the 1980s on our psyche uh, in the ways in which this, the kind of um, scapegoating, you know, racism has always been present, right? That's, that's, a, that's the reality of racial capitalism and that's the reality of the world. But the very specific racial scapegoating that is connected to nationalism um, has really been on the rise and correlates with the rise of austerity because austerity very much relies on that scarcity um, model of thinking and being and, and, and being in the world and, and doing politics in the world. And so I think, you know, those are um, two of, of many factors that I think we need to be attentive to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it also and then tracing the connections between these, you know, at first glance, seemingly uh, different uh, currents. I'm also thinking about uh, some of the forces that are funding and providing the resources for them. And if we trace some of these, right, you know, apparently the fossil fuel industry is funding, um, you know, the far right in, you know, in India and in the United States. Uh, so, you know, what are kind of the material bases uh, that they draw on as well that are global in nature? Yeah, and you know, that's one thing right now, for example, in, you know, in India, India's in, in the midst of, you know, one of the world's largest protests with the farmers protests in India that are ongoing, just surpassing, you know, three, four months now. 
Um, and Narendra Modi, who's a Hindu fascist in India, like many other you know, right-wing nationalists, again, presents himself as a, you know, a Hindu nationalist, right? In terms of um, nationalism, localism, but it is not a contradiction that he actually is one of the most business friendly politicians to global capital, right? And so absolutely one of the strongest lobbies, for example, for the farm laws that farmers are resisting in India is both domestic capital, um, you know, if capital can even be domestic, <laughs> um, you know, by Ambani and Adani and other, you know, Indian capitalists, if you will, um, but also very much um, by, you know, the massive lobby that is behind the World Trade Organization and agricultural privatization and, and so-called reform globally. Um, and I think that's a, a really important point, right? Because again, a lot of right-wing nationalists try to present themselves as protecting the quote-unquote national interest but they're very much hand in hand with transnational and global capital. Definitely. Uh, but speaking of India and Modi, um, in your book, uh, that's one of the examples uh, of racial citizenship, which is part of you know, how do you build your argument about the global rise of, of the far right. Could you speak a bit on racial citizenship and how you understand it? Yeah, and I think, you know, again, if um, we were to think in a slight transnational context, um, not limited to, you know, say US, Canada or Europe, we see that citizenship is almost inherently racial in that its, its markers are very much about who belongs in a really kind of simple way. It's about who belongs and who doesn't. And the ideas of who belongs are always racialized, right? And race is not, as we know, is a social construct. Um, it's constantly being made and you know I and others would argue that citizenship is one of the ways in which race is made um, and I think uh, perhaps one of the most seemingly mundane examples but I think an important one uh, is the ways in which people get asked where are you from <laughs> right you get asked where are you from and you could say you know I'm from this city I'm from this town and then you guess you get asked no where are you really really from right the the signifier of being the eternal outsider. And so in that way, citizenship has very little to do, um, or I should say it has very little to exclusively do with one's actual legal status, right? Whether you are actually a citizen or not, and very much to do with how you are read and understood based on race as belonging or non-belonging, that kind of idea of being the hyphenated citizen, the citizen who is always hyphenated, never citizen enough. Um, and that is precisely because citizenship has less to do with what passport you carry, though, of course, that is hugely important. What passport you carry determines your access to the world, um, but also very much has to do with, um, you know, racial social organization. Um, and that is so deeply embedded in white supremacy and anti-blackness and, you know, uh, Islamophobia and so much more depending on, on where you are in the world. Right. And that that's how, you know, folks who you know, maybe have lived uh, in India or Dominican Republic for, for generations, find themselves denaturalized, right? And their citizenship questioned, um, it, and it's shaped very much by racialized ideas of who belongs. Um, but at the same time, right, I'm, I'm hearing you um, say this about racial citizenship and, and thinking about the extent to which uh, the immigrant rights movement particularly in the United States, is, is really focused on the road to citizenship, the pathway to citizenship, for, usually for a defined group of immigrants who are deserving of this path that must not be too easy. Right? That's usually uh, one of the narratives. And that have distinguished themselves by most recently you know, sacrificing their well-being as essential workers in the service of, uh, of citizens. Um, it, or defined as, uh, you know, youth that were brought to the United States through, quote unquote, no fault of their own. Um, and so your, the way you think about citizenship, I think, is, is in contrast with the way that it is often used in the mainstream immigrant rights movement. Um, why do you think that is? Why do we keep doing that? <laughs> Why do we keep doing that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, a few things come to mind. Uh, one is I just want to briefly pick up on, you know, what you were saying about um, in the Dominican Republic and in India and people being stripped of citizenship. And just to highlight, 
how important it is for us to be tracing alongside um, what's happening to migrants and refugees and undocumented people is to think alongside what is happening to citizens who are being stripped of their citizenship, right? So as you said, citizens who are being made migrants in their homelands, um, which, you know, again, is one of the ways in which citizenship starts to unravel, because if you can strip uh, certain people of citizenship based on ideas of desirability and undesirability, it renders the concept of citizenship um, not hollow, but again, not, not simply about legality, right, but as connected to broader forces. And, and you know, I think the growing crisis of statelessness is so important um, to think alongside migrant and refugee um, justice. And, you know, and I think to that question of, you know, why do we keep doing that? I think a few things. One is because citizenship as a legal status continues to be um, the goalpost, unfortunately, in the migrant justice movement. And I think it does a few things. One is it homogenizes and naturalizes the idea of citizenship when in fact we need to be destabilizing citizenship. Um, and you know, here I'm thinking especially of what that means in, for example, the US and Canadian context for indigenous nations and communities and black people. And you know, Fred Moten, for example, uses the turn of phrase internal alien to describe the position of black people, right? Which is that it doesn't dependent on whether you're a citizen or not. Um, you're constantly in a position of being an internal alien um, or, you know, in, in as Black as Resistance, Zoe and William write, Zoe Zamzu Zamduzi and William Anderson write um, about Black people being positioned constantly as non-citizens. Um, and also what that means for Indigenous nations and Indigenous people who are captured by nation states and forcibly made citizens in settler colonial states. Um, and, you know, Indigenous author Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz writes about the myth of the nation of immigrants, right? That we're not actually a nation of immigrants because that erases conquest and enslavement in particular. And so I think those are the kinds of destabilizations that are necessary when we're thinking about citizenship. Um, while of course recognizing that citizenship has real material impacts in people's lives, right? Like without, without citizenship or immigration status, um, there are real impacts for your, your social, political and economic um, Kind of positioning in in society um, i think the other thing that we need to be thoughtful about when we hold on to citizenship for certain people is of course how that continues to maintain the hierarchies um, of of oppression right so most often when we look at some of the migrant justice movements and the ways in which it has upheld citizenship as um you know the idea that the kind of common refrain which i hope is shifting in particular in response to critiques um, by black organizers, by black immigrants and refugees, by organizations like the Black Alliance for Just Immigration in the United States, that the conflation of immigration as a kind of brown issue really erases the centrality and the specific experience, for example, of black migrants and refugees. And how for black migrants and refugees, a lot of the pathways to citizenship um, and immigration reform and you know, that have been kind of lauded as movement progress have actually thrown predominantly black folks under the bus and you know, Afro Latinx people under the bus because those are the communities who are most impacted by the kind of prison to expulsion pipeline, right? So when we're advocating for migrant justice to say, immigrants are not criminals, who does that throw under the bus? When we're advocating for pathways to citizenship to say, you know, if you have an education, if you don't have a criminal record, if you have a, a job in the wage economy, you know, then we're going to advocate for you to have a pathway to citizenship because you kind of fit the, the narrative of being a productive immigrant, of being white adjacent, of being, you know, middle class or have class mobility and don't fit the category of undesirable, then of course, you know, that re-entrenches the idea of good and bad immigrant, which if we are to follow um, in the lead of abolitionist politics, right? That is exactly the framework that we should be rejecting, that we should not be following a politics of innocence, um, that we should not have to, we should not be organizing our movements around whether people are worthy of citizenship or whether they fit in the desirable and good category, but rather we have to be fighting against the border and citizenship itself, right? That is the way that we have to orient ourselves. And so, you know, as you mentioned, the movement that I've been part of 
is no one is illegal, which I think shifts the gaze from are migrants worthy or not um, to the fundamental idea that no human being is illegal. And a corollary to that that we often say is no one is illegal, Canada is illegal, to highlight the settler colonial nature of the state and how borders are illegal on, on stolen indigenous lands. And so for me, I very much um, think that we need to be challenging the idea of citizenship and illegality because it is just as much of a political construction as criminality. Absolutely. I also think of how the ways in which the politics of um, innocence also serve to make innocent, uh, you know, the, um, the architects uh, of the systems of oppression themselves and all of us who help perpetuate that, right? So it works to make us innocent as well uh, by focusing on those who deserve to pass through yeah. the existing system. Yeah, and I think we see that, especially when we're talking about border deaths, right? <laughs> I, I write about this quite a bit in Border and Rule um, because you know the thing that really disturbs me amongst many other things is that we talk about precisely as you said, you know, when we talk about border deaths, we talk about them in such a passive way and it makes the systems innocent, right? Because we, we present deaths as somehow happening from natural causes. It doesn't implicate the state. It doesn't implicate the border. Um, and it becomes this humanitarian tragedy. Like look at how many people are dying in the Sonoran Desert. Look at what's happening in the Mediterranean, the world's deadliest border, as if though that is natural, as if though that isn't a result of active state surveillance, drone controls, smart borders, interdiction, like this entire matrix of criminalization of migration that forces people um, into perilous journeys, right? And the entire reason of border militarization is to create death, right? The prevention through deterrence strategy is to say migrants should die in order to deter other migrants. It's a killing machine. It's intended to be. Um, but we never say border killings, right? We say border deaths, which exactly as you said, just makes um, innocent the systems that create the conditions of, of death and killing. And often perversely actually ends up blaming the migrants, right? To say, well, they took dangerous journeys, which is a really victim blaming narrative that is you know, very similar to victim blaming in rape culture, right? Where the survivors, um, and those who are suffering and subjected to violence somehow become responsible for creating the conditions of violence. Yeah, I want to go back to something you, you said uh, a few minutes ago um, when you were referring to Canada or the country currently known as Canada. Um, from the U.S. perspective, particularly, you know, when Trump election happened, you know, for U.S.-based liberals, Canada is kind of a shining beacon of welcoming immigrants. And there's a lot of discourse coming from Canadian government on, you know, we welcome refugees. We're not like the US. Can you take that apart for us a little bit? Oh, happily. <laughs> <laughs> Living here, it's like, ah. um, you know, there's, there's a lot that um, I could say on that, because of course, being in Canada, whenever I'm uh, particularly in the United States, um, you know, it's always the, the frame that I, I hear back, which is, well, at least you're not in the United States, which is again, why I was just so compelled to write from a transnational perspective, right? Um, which is that we really need to understand how systems of, of violence are often actually perfected elsewhere. And I think this is particularly important for people residing in the United States to see and understand as it relates to immigration issues at large. Um, you know, Immigration detention, for example, and Chinese exclusion, as you mentioned earlier in your opening, those systems were perfected in Australia. Some of the first anti-Asian exclusion laws um, were perfected in Australia as part of the British colonial empire, right? As part of that period in time. Um, and then traveled to the United, to the Pacific Northwest in particular of, of US and Canada as we now know it. Um, but yeah, when it, when it comes to Canadian immigration, um, that is a, a, an embedded myth about Canada. Um, and of course, that's part of Canada's PR strategy. Canada was the first country in the world to officially adopt a multiculturalism policy, which is you know, now known across, around the world and its template is followed. Um, but the corollary to that, the very important corollary to that, and I think really important to understand in, um, in the context of racial capitalism is that Canada has perfected uh, what we know as internationally as temporary labor migration or managed migration. 
And managed migration really is the contemporary bracero program, right? Indentureship, where people are brought in as workers to work in predominantly low wage sectors, sectors that are low wage, not because, you know, because the work is intentionally devalued, as I'm sure you all know, um, to work as domestic workers, to work as construction workers, to work as farm workers. Um, and when their labor is no longer needed, they are, they are returned. Um, and so Canada has actually perfected the system of temporary labor migration. So as Canada was declaring that it was a multicultural um, nation and adopted multiculturalism and declared that it was a nation of immigrants, um, when Canada says we're a nation of immigrants, it means that it's mostly statistically um, bringing in temporary migrant workers. And you know, migrant workers really are a pillar of contemporary racial capitalism, right? Which is that um, as capital increasingly flows across borders, um, domestic, domestic capital requires cheapened labor, right? So the labor that can't be outsourced needs to be insourced. And so migrant workers are essentially a euphemism for third world workers, right? Third world workers working in the first world under conditions of third world cheapened labor. Um, and the border acts as a spatial fix for capital in that regard, right? So migrant workers don't have to be paid a minimum wage. Um, if they threaten to unionize or if they organize, you can be deported right away, right? So termination and deportation kind of work in tandem. And it's a system of perfected contemporary indentureship where you are tied to an employer. If you lose your employment, you are terminated, you are deported. Um, you are often forced as a migrant worker to live in labor camps um, that your employer provides. This is a carceral regime, right? You are not, you are contained in the home or contained in agricultural work camps. Um, and so this is a system that Canada perfected. And today around the world, this system in Canada, of course it exists elsewhere in the world, but the, the specific bureaucratic way that Canada has perfected the system such that it is so rare that temporary migrant workers become undocumented because the surveillance is so intense, right? As soon as your contract is up, you are on a flight back. If you get an injury, you don't get, you know, Canada is lauded for universal health care. If you're a migrant worker and you get an injury on the job, you are subjected to what's called medical deportation, right? You are on a plane. And so the way in which Canada has perfected this circular labor migration um, is called a Rolls Royce around the world. And the United States is actually looking to implement um, this program, not the other way around. And so I think that's just, you know, one of the many ways in which we see that the technologies that the United States implements actually comes from elsewhere. And in the case of temporary labor migration, it comes from, from Canada. Um, and, you know, because Canada is able to perfect this, there isn't necessarily that many undocumented people, not because, not because it's easy to become an immigrant in Canada, but because the surveillance is so intense um, that as soon as there is a threat of someone becoming undocumented, uh, they are deported. And that's, that's the reality. Undocumented people cannot access services in Canada the way that they might be able to say in the United States. And here I'm not interested in comparisons, right? I'm not about what's better or worse because that's a zero sum game that is, is not useful. Um, but just to give people an insight um, into what it means to be undocumented in Canada is, is vastly different um, than what it might mean in the United States. Super interesting. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of temporary migrants, um, more familiar with the US context, the situation uh, you know, of indentured servitude, it extends to the highly skilled, which are often thought of like, well, you know, we think of agricultural workers and all they're going through. But you know, we have all these highly skilled uh, workers in the tech industry in the US, for example, whose employer to whom they're tied is not even a company, but uh, is a subcontractor that moves them you know, day to day, week to week, back and forth across different work sites across the country you know, filling in as needed uh, in a very exploitative manner while often taking their passports. And here I'm referring to my colleague Payal Banerjee's work. Um, but yes, it's, uh, you know, it's pervasive across the different yeah. sectors. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where the role of the border is so critical um, because I think there's, um, you know, there's often been an ebb and flow, but I would say right now there's an increasing trend amongst the left um, to argue that the border is a left response or can be a left response to transnational capital, right? So 
in response to the free flow of capital across borders, many leftists, particularly kind of Keynesian social democrat lefts, uh, makes the argument or attempt to make the argument that the border will protect against the free flow of capital and that, you know, shutting down the border um, to migrant workers, wherever they are, as you note, um, in the kind of, um, you know, within the labor market, that that will protect and uh, against other workers, right? So the idea that migrant workers are stealing our jobs, driving down our wages, this is not only a right-wing response, you can also hear this response um, amongst many aspects of the traditional left. And this, of course, harkens back to, you know, 100 years ago, the very explicitly racist um, jargon against migrant workers um, in which much of the left was implicated. But I think we're seeing a rise in this, which circles back to your original question about the rise of the right. You know, there's increasingly protectionist rhetoric also amongst the left um, that really relies on the border as a kind of protective measure against transnational capital. And I think that is a flawed, um, that is a flawed argument. It is of course flawed because it's unethical and immoral and, and racist. <laughs> To deny, you know, it's essentially an anti-migrant, um, uh, an anti-migrant argument, but also it's flawed because it it isn't strategically right, right? If you use the border against migrant workers, you're just going to continue to segment the labor force. What we actually need is no borders, so that everyone is able to get paid the same, right? So that employers cannot use um, migrant workers in this kind of um, in this kind of way to be pitted against so-called citizen workers. And so that we actually lift the wage for the wage floor for all, that all workers have the right to permanent residency, have the right to um, have the right to unionize, have the right to labor and safety protections. And so I think we need the opposite response, which is not to say that the border will protect against capital um, or you know, will protect workers, but that actually a no border politics is what protects workers. Right, and, and it would work the other way too, because you also have workers, you know, held against their will, contained, you know, in, in you know countries like Honduras, where the U.S. actually paying for border security to keep workers in, so they they can continue to produce for for capital, uh, you know, these low wages rather than migrate somewhere where they could get more. But but Harsha, I I heard you speak about abolishing borders and about no borders. There's also an open borders argument, and I wonder if you could tell us what the difference is and why you specifically say no borders rather than open borders. Yeah, for me, I think of um, I think no borders gets to the root of the issues in a different way. So I think you know open borders assumes that the world will continue to be organized in the way that it is. Um, and then we open the borders, <laughs> right? Um, and so open border politics um, largely, and of course, you know, politics can change, but largely open border politics has, has focused on the site of the border itself rather than the social organization uh, of the world. And so to me, a no borders politics is different because it thinks about migration in the context of displacement, right? So to me, we cannot only talk about migration, which, you know, drawing on what you were just saying, in which we're not also talking about what are the social conditions, what are the contemporary conditions of power and imperialism and capitalism that force people to migrate. Um, and so, you know, one of the things um, that I talk about in Border and Rule, and this is, you know, certainly not only me, many of many people have, have been thinking about this and acting on this, which is that we can't talk about a migration crisis, right? Migration is the outcome of the actual crisis of displacement and immobility, right? People are forced from their lands, forced from their homes, and then actually immobilized. There isn't free movement at all. And even when there is uh, the perception of movement, it's under these very constrained conditions that we're talking about. And so to me, a no border politics um, recognizes that if we are to have no borders, it also means the entire reorganization of the world as we know it, right? That it is connected to ensuring that people have the freedom to stay where they are and have the freedom to move. And that those two are not contradictions, but that they are corollaries that are needed to end capitalism, to end colonialism, to end racial capitalism, to end social, you know, the organization of difference and oppression in our world. Um, and that to me is a no border politics, which is a radical transformation of the world in which a no border politics is part and parcel of no police, no prisons, no sweatshops, right? 
um, those all go together. No banks, no bosses, all of that. Um, no borders fits into that, that bigger picture rather than an open border politics, which presumes that the world stays um, as it is. And you know, a lot of open border politics, for example, is fixated on the organization of the European Union. Right. And what might it mean mm -hmm. for the European Union to make to have open borders either within the EU, which is, you know, what the EU is predicated on, um, or in relationship to countries attempting to enter the EU into the Schengen zone. But that says nothing about the actual creation and construction and idea of Europe from the onset, right? Like, how does Europe even exist in the world other than in relationship? a deep relationship of violence and exploitation to the rest of the world. And so a no border politics is, is deeper than um, an, an open border one, I think. Um, so I think anyone listening to this conversation already kind of has a sense that in advocating for migrant rights, you uh, would want us to do more than just focus on migrant rights, right? Um, how Can you tell us more explicitly how you think of um, you know, the struggle for migrant rights in connection to the struggle for indigenous, you know, decolonial struggles or black abolitionist struggles. Um, spell out those connections for us. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think exactly that. And, you know, one of the, um, I think one of the limitations, going back to your earlier question again, um, thank you for these questions, they build on each other. Um, you know, is another limitation of the migrant justice movement that focuses on citizenship often does not link, you know, why people have become migrants, right? And so again, that goes back to, we can't talk about or presume that migrants just come to be and then they need rights, um, which really domesticates the issue. We need to talk about this in this global internationalist perspective, right? It is not a coincidence that the vast majority of people who are migrants are black and brown, people from the so-called global south attempting to move to you know urban areas or higher income countries when we're talking about migrants and refugees we're not talking about you know white expats or white tourists or you know white people on the move on on work visas and that is because migration is completely written and underwritten by the asymmetries of power in in the world and so i think you know that expansive understanding of uh, imperialism in the world is so necessary to make the link to migration, that migrants don't just come to be at the border, that we always need to be asking what has driven people to move, what has displaced people, how are our countries and our governments complicit in that displacement, which also then moves us from that kind of humanitarian charitable idea of like, oh, you know, pity and humanitarianism, like look at the, you know, the kind of spectacle of humanitarian tragedy, look at the children in camps or, you know, look at the deaths on the boats to one of reparations and responsibility, right? That um, if Western governments continue to be complicit in the ravaging and pillaging of the majority of the rest of the world, um, then there's a responsibility, right? That we are bound up in these violences. We are not separate from them. I think that is, you know, one critical connection and which is why I think it is impossible to have a migrant justice movement that is not anti-imperialist for it to be truly rooted in justice. Um, beyond those, you know, those hallowed notions of, of citizenship that you were talking about earlier. Um, and then also, yes, absolutely, very much rooted, um, especially if we're looking in the North American context, let's say, you know, the United States, the entire formation of the southern US-Mexico border um, was completely bound up in indigenous, attempted indigenous elimination and anti-Black enslavement, right? Some of the first, um, some of the first forces and functions of the border, the US-Mexico border, were actually to keep enslaved black people within the border, right? So the KKK and the Texas Rangers and many other forces did not only act to keep migrants out, they also acted uh, to enforce enslavement. And that is, you know, that is the reality of, of the border, uh, the US-Mexico border. It's also a border that of course captured indigenous nations within it. And we continue to see that play out today with you know one of the most militarized regions in the world um, being indigenous nations right to Doni Odom nation where the border wall is built and where that the land is being desecrated nations are being the nation is being separated um, by this artificial border um, and of course the vast majority of people on the move globally 
are also, again, indigenous and black people, right? So we can't assume um, that the issue of migration is separate from indigenous and black liberation because that is the reality of displacement today, right? Um, and some of the, the most stringent um, border militarization that is being enacted is being enacted against, for example, people who are indigenous in Central America who have been captured uh, by Central American settler states, right? By Spanish states. Um, you know, Maya people, for example, who are increasingly on the move in the 1980s. Um, Garifuna communities in Honduras who are increasingly on the move. The Sahel region uh, in Africa is increasingly being militarized because the EU is so fixated on specifically limiting black migration from Africa. Um, we saw that, of course, as you mentioned earlier, you know, um, the, the kind of very specific exclusion that Haitians are being subjected to right now. And, the, and you know, the, the entire contemporary immigration detention system, most people don't know. Most people assume it's, you know, the border and immigration detention was built in relationship to Mexican migration. It was actually built uh, in response to migrations from Haiti, right? That was That is the beginning of the contemporary immigration detention sy system is the mass detention and incarceration of Haitians throughout the 90s. And so all of these, I think, are those um, connections that we need to think about. And, also, and I think what it leads us to is not only about thinking about migrant justice um, as a kind of form of racism, that kind of siloed NGO approach, <laughs> which is like immigrant rights are here, right? Indigenous land defense is here. Uh, Black liberation is here. And they each kind of work on different issues. I think if we look historically and transnationally and internationally about the ways in which bordering regimes work, it shows us that these are mutually constitutive, right? That these are not separate. These are interconnected systems that rely on each other. And borders and prisons have the very same immobilizing carceral logic, right? They have the very same logics built in and baked into um, what they're intended to do. And so I think all of these things, I could say more, I'll stop there, but I think all of these help us to think um, in these more layered ways. Definitely. Um, yes. And then thinking of, you know, always asking, you know, what pushed people to arrive at the border. I think that the climate crisis is increasingly also a site, that question being asked, but also a question of responsibility um, for the, the climate crisis itself. Um, yeah. Harsha, we are going to turn to audience questions to make sure that folks have enough time uh, to uh, to ask you, uh, and we have a lot of questions already. So um, since you were just mentioning prisons, I, uh, we have a question from Dr. Jean Beeman, uh, who is wondering if you could speak to the role of the police in enforcing borders and state violence. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the, the things that we can think about, thank you for that question, um, is how police and prisons really are a pipeline to expulsion, right? And a lot of countries, particularly including in the United States, uh, folks who are racially profiled, stop and frisk, subjected to the white supremacy of police, then often get caught up in the criminalizing matrix that then eventually leads to their deportation, right? And again, here, those who are most likely to be impacted by police violence are then the most likely to be subjected um, to uh, the kind of prison to deportation pipeline. Um, and you know, at different parts in, uh, of, of history in the United States, but even as, as recently as, as the past decade, over half of all federal arrests in the United States were immigration related, right? And so that very much involved collaborations between police and border agents and, you know, inland ICE. And so police are very much involved in maintaining the border regime. And that is why, again, I think it's so important to think about the border not just as a, you know, a map on the, or a line on the map rather, um, but as an elastic regime that is being enforced not only at the border, but is being enforced inland and police play such a central role in that enforcement. Um, and I think the corollary to that that's really important for um, people to, to think about is, you know, even in kind of putatively social welfare states like Canada or the Nordic countries that are so celebrated, um, for their social democracy. In those states, it's just as much the police as it is the social services that are implicated in reporting people to immigration, right? So in Canada, again, coming back to our healthcare system, you know, much lauded, much celebrated. And of course, this is not an argument against public healthcare. 
But this is an argument about how public services that are so embedded in the state that rely on the states that are organized through the state end up being an arm of, it, of immigration enforcement. So, you know, even though you can get free treatment um, in Canada, once you receive that treatment and it's found, it's found out that you are undocumented or without status, you are right away deported, right? Um, and that happens also in Nordic countries if you're trying to access social assistance um, or any of the other kind of arms of the social welfare state. And so um, I think the border is maintained by police and we see that through the arrests and collaborations, you know, secure communities, for example, the secure communities initiative um, that really entrenched police and immigration enforcement. And we also see it through, I think importantly, other arms of, of the carceral state. Um, but that are not seen as arms of the carceral state that are seen as the care sector um, of the state. Absolutely, so important. And if anyone's curious about how this plays out in the US, uh, Lisa Park, uh, UC Santa Barbara writes about medical deportations in the mm -hmm. United States, which are definitely also a thing. Um, we have a question, this is, we're at a labor school, so we have to ask this important question, is what is the role of the international labor movement as a force for justice and fascist capitalist plunder, and what rank and file activists must do within their own unions, and especially dislodging corporate leadership to achieve the solidarity? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the one of the strongest, um, or two of the strongest, I should say, international labor movements that I think um, are really doing important visionary work on the issue of transnational labor rights, um, particularly around migrant labor, uh, is the International Domestic Workers Union. So it has many affiliates, but really focusing on domestic workers, right, who really are at the nexus of race, class, gender, um, citizenship status, and more. Um, and so doing some of the most incredible work around ensuring um, the labor rights of migrant workers around the world. And again, migrant workers, domestic, migrant domestic workers, sorry, being some of the most vulnerable, right? Made most vulnerable um, across nation states. And the other really are uh, food justice unions, right? So unions that are organizing um, for food sovereignty, thinking here of the MST, of course, um, and all of their affiliates in Via Campesina and all of their affiliates and working alongside at migrant farm workers, but also alongside indigenous communities to think about what does it mean to um, produce food in a way that is sustainable to the land, um, and that is also produced in a way um, that respects the rights of workers who are producing that food all throughout the food supply chain. And so, you know, those are some of the movements and I think they have some of the best positions <laughs> politically because of course they're not uh, a corporate um, social unionism, business side unionism, right? Um, they really are built on the principles of social solidarity um, rather than corporate unionism. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is I will just reiterate that I think it is so important to push unions in two key ways. One is having unions repudiate um, the kind of implied brotherhood that a lot of unions have um, with police and border union guards, right? Like really the, the, the important movement to refuse police unions um, as part of the big tent of, of labor, I think is important and needing to add um, unions that represent border guards and that really just fight for the interests of border guards within that. Um, and that'll look different in, in each context, but I think that is really important is to, to fight for those uh, affiliates to be kicked out <laughs> of the union movement. Um, and the other is really to push unions in, uh, in a way that is internationalist, right? So a lot of unions, again, as I mentioned earlier, have been taking on this regressive position um, where instead of supporting migrant workers, they take on the position that migrant workers are scab workers, which is again, really racist and ethically wrong and strategically wrong. And so instead, I think the push should be um, for uh, immigration status for all and the rights to unionization and labor rights for all. So I think we need to be pushing unions to take um, a radically different position from the ones that a majority of them are taking. But again, I know that um, less about the US context, but I know that there are you know, American um, unions who are, who are tending towards that direction. And I think they should be pushed in that regard. By the rank and file. Yes, um, by the rank and file. <laughs> uh, and I also, I neglected to thank uh, Miriam Thompson for that great question. Um, we have a question that kind of a strategy question for, for, the, for the movement. Uh, Juan Pablo Blanco asks, um, if you 
to talk a little more about the tension between harm reduction with the whole road to citizenship approach and the struggle for no borders. How do we hold the necessity of one knowing that it may go against this bigger transformational aim? Oh my God, that's a good question. Um, and I try to tackle that more in, in my in my first book, which is you know more around organizing and how do we on the ground make sense of those contradictions. Um, when I think about it, I think about it in primarily through one way, right? Which is yes, as we were saying earlier, citizenship is false, <laughs> um, and we need to get rid of citizenship and we need to get rid of borders. And also, that's the material reality and terrain of struggle in this moment, right? People are fighting for citizenship. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I think the things that we need to be thinking about is twofold. Um, one is how can we fight for citizenship exactly as you asked um, as a harm reduction strategy while also challenging it. And I think part of that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as a member of the no one is legal movement, we would talk about, as I said, no one is legal, Canada is illegal, right? Which is that you're also destabilizing the nation state that is granting citizenship in the same breath as you know, demanding citizenship rights, right? So I think always um, having that be forefronted um, and to offer solidarity to those communities who may be citizens on paper, but of course, for whom citizenship is hallowed out, right? So always connecting the fight for citizenship as an incomplete struggle um, and to not assume that citizenship is the end of the struggle and to, you know, always be verbalizing that in our organizing. Um, and the second is in the fight for citizenship, really to make sure no one is left behind, that we aren't advocating for campaigns um, or for movements in such a way um, that it throws other people under the bus. And so to really be arguing that uh, because citizenship by its nature is intended to create categories of desirable and undesirable, to fight for citizenship while pushing back against what citizenship is intended to do. Um, by really saying status for all people, right? Immigration status for all people, um, which kind of blows open the door and the idea of citizenship as like, you know, the idea of pathway to citizenship or proving your citizenship or being a good immigrant, et cetera, um, by saying that it actually should be available to all people, um, which I think, you know, can play on a no border politics because you're basically making the border obsolete by saying all people should be granted status. Definitely, in the U.S. context, that that would be the hashtag all 11 million, right? So it would be citizenship for all 11 million yeah. estimated undocumented folks. Yeah, and temporary workers, right? And that's, yes. that's the part, too, is making sure that people who have status are, you know, have actual full status, not these indentured kind of um, status relationships. Absolutely. Um, okay, we have two kind of related questions. Uh, Enrique gonzalez Conti asks, um, if you can talk more about the idea of smart borders and how are imperial borders evolving today. And uh, Samina Fahadi um, has a, a related question on surveillance systems of workers, including you know, the temporary workers that you mentioned earlier and how we organized against it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for asking about uh, imperial borders because I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but it's one of the things that I'm, um, really thinking about a lot these days, um, but I'll, I'll start with with smart borders um, and, and it connects and, um, you know, increasingly, uh, as you both have noted in your questions, smart, I wish I could see people. <laughs> um, it feels so weird always to speak in Zoom world um, and the surveillance of this platform, but um, the the organization of smart borders, I think is it's, it's so important to think about because so much of um, of the right, for example, relies on the symbol of the border wall, right? So Trump, for example, I'm not limited to, but Trump as an example, just really heavily relied on the symbolism of the wall. Um, but of course, you know, even as much as you know, Biden has promised that he's not going to put any more money into building the border wall, he doesn't need to because the Democrats, for example, really perfected smart borders, right? Where you don't need the symbolism of the wall itself and all that that it represents, that overpowering sense of exclusion. Um, and might and dominance and patriarchy and nationalism and more. Um, but you rely on smart borders, right? Um, with with uh, surveillance systems um, launched by, you know, Amazon, Palantir, all these corporate leeches, Elbit, which builds border systems and border walls, you know, from Israel to the, to the US-Mexico border. Um, so these kinds of smart borders um, where surveillance is happening through these kind of high-tech 
uh, facial recognition technology, um, also increasingly um, AI being used in refugee processing. Um, so, you know, where determination of whether someone can stay or not is through an AI system, you know, Canada is piloting that, EU has been piloting various versions of these. EU, of course, has a massive smart border system in the entire Schengen zone. Um, that is uh, an electronic border system. Um, and so, you know, the way that we fight it can often be harder because that uh, we can't see it, right? In the same way that it's become harder to organize an effective anti-war movement because war is not organized through, you know, the, the precision of drone strikes, right? We don't, we don't see it in the same way as we used to see, um, as the way we used to see on the ground war, right? Um, and so I think that is one of the things that is really hard for people to understand human impact is because we're dealing with a, a web of technological invisible and surveillance. Um, but of course we have to, but I just wanted to name that I think that can be very hard to grasp onto um, in the material sense for, for all of us. Um, and you know, uh, around imperial borders, I just wanna take a minute to talk about that um, because I think it's so uh, important um, to see how borders are increasingly a method of imperialism, right? So we kind of live in this era where it's become almost, um, you know, it's become uh, the kind of trend to say we live in a post-imperial world or post-colonial world. And there's many ways in which that's obviously not true, but I think um, the outsourcing of borders is one of the key methods of contemporary imperialism. And also because I think oftentimes we don't talk about imperialism in relationship to migration at all. Um, if we do, it's limited to what we were talking about earlier, like imperialism as a cause of migration. Um, you know, so it's a cause and effect relationship, but I think imperialism is increasingly a pillar um, or migration is increasingly a, a pillar of imperialism. And how we see that is through the outsourcing of borders, often through the outsourcing of smart borders. And, you know, the United States, the EU, Australia, Canada, have all increasingly moved their borders outwards. You know, we were talking about policing and how the border can be enforced inland. Increasingly, migration prevention happens by outsourcing the border. Um, so countries like the United States and countries in the EU increasingly make all trade and aid and development agreements with countries in Central America in the case of the United States or countries in the Middle East and Africa in the case of the EU, contingent on migration prevention. Right. So if you are a country in the so-called global south that is already, you know, devastated by legacies of um, imperialism and, and capitalism and exploitation and continued exploitation and extraction of your resources, and you are signing and subjected to these trade and aid agreements by the EU or the United States, as part of those, there will often be clauses around migration prevention. And the EU is sinking billions and billions of euros into smart borders, as well as straight up border, you know, border security boots on the ground across the Sahel region in Africa, where billions of euros are going to not militarize the Mediterranean or the EU, but actually moving and externalizing the border. And of course, in the United States, this is really evident right now um, in Mexico, right, where the Mexican government and Mexican authorities are being paid, coerced, etc., um, to enforce U.S. to enforce U.S. border policies in Mexico against Central American migrants, right? And this was perfected um, by President Obama and is being continued by President Biden. And so um, just th thank you for that question, because I think the outsourcing of borders in our contemporary era is something we need to think more about, because the frontiers of border militarization are no longer um, the borders of the so-called rich countries and, and the so-called global north. It's increasingly countries in the global south, countries like Papua New Guinea, countries like Nauru, countries like Indonesia, uh, countries like Libya, Mauritania, Tunisia, uh, Mexico. These are the countries that are the frontiers of border militarization where most of um, money is going into militarizing borders. And again, they are militarizing their borders in order to uphold imperial border policies of global north countries. Absolutely. Harsha, we have time for one more question. Uh, we, and I'm sorry, we have amazing questions from the audience, but- I can't see them, sorry, so I have no idea what they are or how many there are. Take my word for it, but um, okay. <laughs> I think you're here all day. So um, I have a question from Dale Youssef. Um, how do you think, um, uh, how can you think the no border um, help eliminate racism 
given that in some cases, discrimination and racism emerge or are manifested on communitarian levels as borders might be incarnated. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to understand that one again. Do you mind repeating it? I am going to paste it for you. Okay, oh, I think I see it in the chat. You see it? I'm, just, I'm not quite sure I totally understand the question. If, if whoever typed it doesn't mind typing in something else to help me understand it a bit better. Um, while we wait for that to happen, I, 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 the way they understand this question is, yeah. is basically about the connection between borders and racism, right? And uh, to, is the fight for the abolition of borders uh, a different fight than the fight against racism? And uh, I think this question is getting at, you know, your thoughts on the sources of racism, if that makes sense. And I'm sorry, Dali, if I'm totally butchering <laughs> your question. Yeah, I can. Um, I'll 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 answer that. And I'm I'm thinking I was thinking it might mean something else. So we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll Dahlia will write in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as we were talking about earlier, I think citizenship, uh, as it's connected to the nation state, is is constructed through race. Citizenship is one of the pillars of racial social organization. Um, and you know, in all the ways that we've been we've been chatting about, and how it's a race making regime and affixes race to the nation state, right? Um, and you know, if I understand this question, um, the way that I was understanding it is, you know, do borders sometimes serve a communitarian purpose um, in terms of defining who communities are? Uh, I think you know the reality is it does, but that's because we are in the social organization of the world that we're in today, right? Where again, sometimes people think borders will protect in the same ways that there's the logic that borders will protect against capital. Um, you know, sometimes there is the idea that borders will protect against, uh, you know, against imperialism, right? Like our borders will protect us. Um, the reality is, is of course, borders don't protect uh, countries in the, you know, countries in the global south, for example, because that's, that's not what happens, right? We see imperial wars constantly violating the sovereignty of, of nations in the global south. And so I think it is important to um, distangle borders as a kind of anti-colonial or anti-capitalist architecture and to see them for, for what they are. Um, and absolutely, there are various ways in which communities organize themselves, but I don't think they're the same as the border, right? And this, the border is, is a very much a pillar of state violence. Um, in the same ways, if I can draw this analogy, um, you know, if there is a community that is organizing itself around restorative justice and community, community accountability in response to gendered violence, community accountability is not the same as the structure of a prison. And so I think that is important to realize because people can defend their territory, their land and their homes in ways that may seem like it is enforcing a border, but it is not because you know a border like a prison um, is very much embedded in the state by its very nature. Um, and again, it's you know it's not just about a line on a map, uh, and it's very much embedded um, in state violence. And so I think it's important to tease out the difference uh, between community forms of social organization and justice um, and self defense, if you will, from state structures of violence. Thanks. Well, um, I want to thank Harsha Walia for taking the time to visit us at uh, thank you. CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Uh, thanks everyone who came, who asked these all. wonderful questions. Um, do you want to say anything, Harsha, parting words? Thank you so much for having me. And if um, I didn't answer any questions, my apologies. Feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Um, and. Before we go, I want to let everyone know about a, a, a working class New York revisited conference that is taking place uh, at King Slu on April 23rd. Everyone is invited. Uh, please register. Uh, it's going to be a really great conference. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>